Welcome. This is a panel, um, and we're all near-death experiencers, and we're going to talk a little bit about our experiences, but the main port reason we have these panels is so you can ask your questions. So if you have a question, feel free to go up to the microphone and ask your question. We won't take the questions from the floor. Um, and so to get started, maybe we'll talk a little bit about ourselves. Um, I have Bernd Bertka. He's from Frankfurt, Germany, on this side. I have Anna Gonzalez. She's from Mexico in what town? Monterey, Mexico. Monterey, Mexico. And I'm Alan Huguenot from San Francisco. So I'm the only one that didn't come from another place, another country. But um, I'm just moderating. We really want to hear what they have to tell us. Now, some of you were in the previous session, which I was leading, so don't concentrate all your questions on me. Let's ask everybody questions, all right? Um, because that's what we're here for, is to get the information that the experiencers have for us. So first I'd like to uh, maybe have Bernd, Bert, can give me five minutes about your own experience, what it was like, and then I'll ask Anna to give me five minutes, and then we'll ask you for questions, and we'll go deeper into it. Okay, I try to keep it short. Six years ago, I had a cardiac arrest for about 20 minutes, um, and um, at that time, I had a very strange experience, strange to me, I was somehow waking up, moving very fast through trees. It was a green scenery. I was moving, and I, it was like waking up in a train. And I thought, oh, what's happening here? This is very strange. Maybe I fell asleep or something. I don't know. And then suddenly it goes up in an L form, and it rose over Frankfurt, and I saw Frankfurt at night, it was at night, three o'clock or something. And I thought, whoops, what's that going on, what they're going on? Those lights, am I flying? Couldn't be, that's somehow different than a plane. It was completely silent, I didn't hear anything. It was a kind of majestic silence, so to, sp so to say. And I moved on and moved on, and the horizon was bending, and I saw the earth, and I thought, Oops, what's going on here? And it went on, always accelerating, moving faster and faster. And then, I, it was like riding on a prefixed trail. I had no influence on direction or speed, and it, no, no feeling of temperature or sound. And I thought, there's really something wrong here. This is very, very strange what's happening to me there. And I moved, I saw the, I saw the earth and then I, I moved by the moon. And it's not easy to tell you that without being moved again. We all experience this again when we talk about it. That's why we get emotional. It's that Just real. give me two seconds. Just give me three seconds. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> and um, I, I felt a deep feeling of gratitude for being experiencing this, what was going on. And I, I dived into a field of, we would say, love, something like a reddish feeling of being completely loved with all your faults and all your things. Sorry. Okay, I moved on. Don't worry. No, no, it's okay. You can you can have your Don't emotion. Worry. It's part of it. Um, we're we're, and, we're uh, okay. It's and how real it is to us. Things are like that. Uh, okay. I moved on, and I enjoyed it somehow. And it moved, as I said, it was accelerating and accelerating. Without feeling accelerated or touched or something like in a train or so, it was just 
and I suddenly realized that I, the, the body was lost. I was without body. I was just moving me, my mind, or whatever. And I moved on, and I suddenly I, I, I dived out of our Milky Way. <laughs> this is so strange, yeah, anyway. Uh, and I saw the Milky Way, and it was still accelerating. And I saw other galaxies, and it moved on and moved on in different colors without green, interestingly enough. I don't know why there were no green galaxies, but different colors. And moving on, moving on, then I came to a darker area, I still moving, but there were less, ga less, less galaxies. And then I a voice formed inside of me and said, what do you do here? You are too early. You are not right. This is not the right thing for you. I cannot translate that good. It wasn't in German or in English. It was just formulating inside of me somehow. And I said, oh no, I, inside I said, I, don't, I, I want to go on. There was a kind of frontier there was something new coming, I felt that. There was a kind of edge or something new coming. If I moved on and I knew I wouldn't come back and I would not come back if I would have gone there. But I was not allowed to go there. And then things, it was like I was slurped back in a two second way and then I kind of wake up and fell unconscious again. That's an excellent description. Um, I hope you all see that he was traveling through galaxies and didn't it sound like he arrived at a dark hole and started to go into it? I mean, if you think about our universe out there and we go through this tunnel to get to the light and so I just love that. That was, that was a wonderful description, um, especially when you said you felt loved, that you were in that wonderful, love, loved place. We're so home. Um, most of us, I'm, I'm doing pretty well at the moment, but we can't talk about it very well because it's so intense where we're at when we're back there. And that's what you were experiencing with him. He was trying to say it, and yet when we're saying it, it gets us. So it's very much like that. It was a lovely description. You want to give us five minutes on yours, Anna? Okay, I'm going to try to keep it short, too. For me, it was a little different. I was born with a very, very serious heart condition, and my parents were told that I was just gonna live for about seven to eight years because there was no surgery or anything that could be done for any doctors here. It, I have transposition of the great vessels, one single ventricle, and pulmonary stenosis. That meant that I always had a mixed blue and red blood, and I was lacking oxygen all my life. So at around seven or eight years old, I didn't understand why they took me so often to the doctor if, for me, I was not sick at all. And my parents told me that I had a heart condition and that they didn't know how long was I gonna be okay. And at that moment, I understood perfectly well that I was not going to live forever. By the way, that's the way I named my book because at that time, I understood that Life was not forever for me, like I thought for everybody it was, or children at least. And then I decided that I, I wanted to live life to the fullest. There was something in me, and there was this um, mystical figure or guide that I always uh, felt that I could talk to. I named him Raffle. I think he was a, a, a guide, a light. I, I have always been like in here and over there since that moment. And I always had big conversations with him. I thought he was like a ghost that came to take me away every time he appeared, but we could speak. And I could talk, I could feel perfectly well, but at the same time, I knew that he always came with me when I was in danger, when my health was in danger. And I felt he embraced me or it embraced me, and I felt loved. So that happened, and I was told that I could never get married, never have a start a sexual life or never get pregnant because my body was not gonna make it. I was supposed to be dead. But I kept on living because I really wanted to enjoy life and I started to do this. I didn't even know what meditation was 
at that time, but I did a lot of this, trying to convince oxygen to get into my body and start getting into all of my organs and giving me strength and keeping me alive because I wanted to get married, I wanted to have a family. I, have, I had dreamed with all that and doctors and everybody was just telling me you cannot do that. So I spoke to Raffle all the time, telling him to keep me strong. So I got married and I miraculously had a daughter, uh, got pregnant and brought her a very healthy young baby, four pounds, but she was perfectly healthy. And then is when my heart got this condition that it, I, I believe that I convinced my body in a way to keep healthy up to where there was a, a surgery for me. When I was 24 years old, just after my daughter was born, she was nine months old, is then a surgery was there for me. And then I, when I got there, doctors couldn't even believe I was alive. Nowadays, I know that I'm the only human being with my condition at my age alive. But when I was there, then is, they had a first surgery. They were going to make up because they had never made, it in, made this in an adult. So I got this uh, surgery. And uh, for some reason, I got all, uh, all the liquid around my lungs and my, and my heart were all, all absolutely full of Staphylococcus aureus. So they wanted to take this liquid out. They didn't even know it was all infected. So when that, they did that, they pinched my heart. And so it started bleeding and I had to go back to surgery. And after that, there was a, a big issue around this because I started to be lacking air and I was dying. And I was awake, I was perfectly awake when this happened. By that time, my husband and parents were already told that that they should get papers ready because I was not going to make it. It was absolutely impossible for me to live after this heart situation and now with all this bacteria. But one minute before I got to surgery, I remember very well seeing my lovely friend, which I never stopped seeing, even though it was like a friend from when I was young. Uh, it was a, a, a how do you call it? Well, I'm an imaginary friend, but for me, it never stopped. I told him, well, please, if you have any way to help me, that I want to come back. I don't want to, I know this is it, but I want to raise my child. She's nine months old. I, I want to raise her. I love her. And I, it was a miracle just bringing her. So I remember very well that conversation. And then I went into a heart arrest and into, into a respiratory arrest. I was struggling because I couldn't breathe. I had a tube inside, and I remember very well all the electrochocks, all this uh, big amount of doctors around me, and at that moment I just went out of my body. And I was all the way in the ceiling, and I could see perfectly well my body lying there, all the doctors around me trying to bring me back, and at that moment I felt absolutely free, no pain, I was feeling nothing, and then I started floating. And for me, it was, instead of this tunnel, I felt like if I went inside a tree, this trunk, and I started to look at incredible uh, scenes. And I was just floating at that moment. I, I saw my parents in the, in the waiting room, praying, and my husband. And my daughter was all the way to Mexico. I was in Houston, Texas by then, because that was the first surgery that could be done to my condition. And I could see her in her crib, and she was sleeping peacefully. And then that didn't matter. I was not anxious about them, them anymore. I felt free, and there was no pain. And then I started to feel a lot of love. And, and then this it's like, like branches. I started floating, and I saw a lot of little animals, squirrels, rabbits, everything, and all this grassy, colorful scenery. And I felt a lot of peace and a lot of love to animals, it's like if I could speak to them. I went on floating and then I saw a lot of bigger animals, giraffes, elephants, tigers, lions, and this colorful scenery was just wonderful. And then I felt more released and loved by all of this magnificent scenery. I kept on f uh, just floating up this tunnel or this trunk, and then I saw children playing around, full of light, full of hope, full of uh, energy. 
And I could only smile and feel peace around this. I kept on floating and I sent, saw adults and all of them, there was a lot of uh, waterfalls and I could hear that the, the sounds were stronger and I, I could, uh, it's like everybody was welcoming me. And I didn't recognize particularly someone, but it's like everybody was family for me. And I just felt loved by every single one of them. It's like if I knew them all. I kept on just going up and flowing. I don't know if it was up or how, but I just kept on looking at these branches with different sceneries. And then there was this, all these uh, old uh, people, but there was no crutches, there were no wheelchairs. Everybody was so much alive. And it was just like he mentioned, it's not the body, but you know that they were perfectly healthy. And then I just kept on floating and I saw this big yellow circle on my head, on top of my head, and I just wanted to go in there. There was so much, nothing else mattered then. Everything was so full of love. I had never felt this. Uh, my, my finger, I, I start feeling all this tickling again. It's, 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 uh, no words are really enough to describe what I felt at that moment. And when I could finally go in, it was like if you, there was a lot of wind down there, out the doors, and if like you open them and suddenly there's a lot of wind coming and it embraced me, but it was not a wind, it was this beautiful, bright, white light. And I felt, it was like if it was in my body and that I was part of this, it was, my head is even circling around now. Uh, it's very strong feeling then. I couldn't move on, I was just there enjoying. And I knew that the rest of the people I was worrying about, they were okay. Everything was perfect then. I was just, I had gone to the final place I wanted, I wanted to be there. And I just felt a hand or something on top of my head and this, like you said, it was not that I, it was a voice, it was just inside my heart. And a voice that said, just stay calm and go back in peace and do everything I've told you. You have, you know what you have to do. And in two seconds, I just came back over everything I had done, and I perfectly remember doctors shouting, cheese back and electrochocks, and my heart ding, ding, ding. And I was so angry, and I said, who told you I wanted to wake up? I want to go back to sleep. In my human mind, I thought I was sleeping, and I honestly felt they were, they were just so, uh, unfair because they didn't ask me if I wanted to wake up and then they started shouting again she's leaving so they electrochocks again that was fighting going and coming because I just in my mind I just said I, I don't want to this hurts too much I just don't want to be here so after a long time I, I, I before I wrote my book I did a lot of investigation because it took me years to understand what had happened at that time, I couldn't even understand or talk about it. But then I knew that they took about an hour to put me just so my heart got a rhythm back again. And then I started asking nurses because I was too, and that my hands were hold, uh, tied to the bed. And I wanted to write, and I said, where was I? And they took the pen away, and they just, don't worry, you're OK. You had a rough time, and nobody answered things. When the tube was taken out, I was so sick. My body recuperated after about a month or so. It went back to normal. But at that time, I could feel love for everyone. There was every single doctor I saw, it was just like being thankful for everything. I wanted to tell people how much I appreciated the work. It was beautiful all the way I felt. All the colors of people were kind of different. And then people even told me that I, would, I had been the most patient patient they had ever had because it took me so long to recover. But I wanted to touch people and I wanted to feel close to them, but it was kind of strange that, and uh, you know, doctors try not to get too close and I wanted them close. It was very difficult. It took me years after I finally understood what had gone on. And EANS for me has been the best, the best option to really feel, I feel like if I'm with family. It has taken a long time. Thank you. I agree. So, thank you, Anna. 
So that's a good place for me to come in because I just woke up with the light. I didn't go through a tunnel and I didn't fly over Frankfurt and I didn't do all those things. I just was there. Now I remember coming back very viscerally and I'll talk about that. So this worked really well the way we put this together. Um, each of us had the same experience, this, this feeling of love, this being overwhelmed by the white light. And I loved what you said about you saw a halo above your head just before you got there. And this is part of what comes in our Christian traditions with the halos over the heads. But she actually saw it. And it's in, in, your, in your crown chakra and you're right there and you saw that. Um, I just woke up with the golden white light and it's real hard to describe it exactly. Um, and I'm totally loved. I'm I, like I'm being a babe held in arms and uh, home. I'm with the spirit of this being of light that uh, is not separate from me. It is me, but I've known this being for probably three, four thousand years. I don't know. It's a long time back. Eons is how I said it at the time. And I just know that I'm home. I'm where I'm supposed to be. And then. Just like we all said, we don't hear words. We suddenly get the notion in our head, ESP, you have to go back. And I said, no, I don't have to go back. This is too cool. I like it here. Um, that we don't, we're, not, we're not going back there. I mean, you know, I know I got girlfriends. I got, you know, a whole, there's a whole life back there, but this is nice. And then, no, you have to go back. You're not done yet. And so then I start to head back and um, I come and P.H. and Matt Water will talk about sparklers and I'll talk about flames. I come down through flames into approximately the top of my head and I slam back into the body and uh, Anna just said it's very painful. Yeah, you, you bet. It's not the pain of our injuries, it's this existence. When you push down on your finger like this, you say, well, I feel my finger. Actually, that's a pain. You just aren't pushing hard enough. It'll get real painful if you push harder. This existence is based on feelings which are actually pain. And uh, I felt this huge painfulness of coming back into this existence, coming back into physical reality. Um, it was not what I wanted at all. After I got back in the body, of course, I could feel my injuries that were there that I had from the motorcycle wreck, because I was killed in a motorcycle wreck, I should have I've told you that, and I was in a coma for 12 hours in the hospital, and I'm coming out of the coma finally, coming back into existence. Now you're gonna laugh because why did I come back? I woke up and I said to the nurse, bring me a phone, and they, she said, he's back, you know, and she started talking to me about it. I, I can't bring you a phone, so I explained to her how you get an extension cord and you plug it in and you bring the phone over and then I can use, you know, this isn't long before cell phones, this is 1970. And so she finally brings me the phone and I finally open my eyes and look to see my hands all, all wrapped up and I can't dial the phone. And so I tell her the phone number, it's 7.55 a.m. and I'm calling the boss to tell him I won't be there. That's why I woke up. And I think sometimes that people that are in long-term comas don't have a reason to wake up. Um, I'm very responsible, so I'm calling the boss. So I hang up after telling, I, I said, I'm in the hospital. He says, what hospital? I said, I don't know. I, I, I was, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a hospital. He said, but what hospital? I said, I don't know. Um, but I've been here, and um, I'm not coming in today. And so I hung up the phone. So my mother, who they'd called and brought, and you know, she'd driven up, and, and so she calls him about two minutes later and says, Alan won't be in today. And he says, I know, he just called me. She says, no, he, he's in a coma. He couldn't have called you. And, and he says, no, he did, he called me. And so she runs down to the hospital. Anyway, that's just kind of fun stuff at the end there. But that being of light, it was the most powerful thing I've ever felt. And then you slam back into this and we came down through flames, okay? I saw candles burning all around me. Uh, PHM saw sparklers all around her. And many physicists have told me that's our extra consciousness annihilating as we come back into this limited consciousness. And I like to think about it that way because we all feel like we knew everything and we could access anything and we had all that consciousness over there. If you come back in, it has to go somewhere. So it just annihilates off. Like I talk about the zero point field and we have you know, stuff 
appears for us and disappears for us right as we're here in this reality, that reality has to disappear so we can be in 3D plus time. And that was what was going on for me. So then I come back, same problem. Nobody wants to hear from me. I can't tell anybody. Um, they don't know where we're coming from. Even loving family can't talk to us. So I, I want to end mine there, trying to just add to what they already said. Um, okay, we've used up about half of our time. So do any of you have questions you want to ask us? If you have questions, just go to the microphone and come up and ask your questions. And we'll ask any one of us and we'll answer. But ask all of us. Don't just come over here because I gave a talk on science. I want to ask all of the experiencers well, I, I about their experience. I want to thank you all. Is this on? Yeah, I want to thank you all for your stories. They're great. And they illustrate such a diversity in what happens to each individual. Um, a question uh, for Bernd. Uh, what, uh, you didn't remark that you had something saying it was time to come back? Because Anna remarked that you were, you were pushed back, and Alan, with your story, that you all were, you knew when to come back. Did something happen to you to uh, say, no, you have to come back to this? Um, I'm not sure I, I got your question, uh, how it happened, how I, how I came back. How you knew that you had to come how I back? Knew. Well, the voice said, I have to go back. And I was drawn back in a very hurtful, as he also said, mm. hurtful, fast, uneasy feeling slurp. Is that a good word, slurp? Yeah. Like, it's it's yeah. so was, dense when you come into the body. It was drawn in in a very un, unpleasant way yeah. and very fast. Yeah, something like that. It's just, yeah. you, you slam into the body. If you think about coming into your head and going into this dense mass of physicalness, it's like wham. It's, and this was the worst part of the whole experience. <laughs> Even dying was easy. Dying's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back's the hard part, yeah. Definitely, it's a hard part. Thank you. That's very interesting. I wanted to know, Alan was talking about slamming back into your body, and when I was reading all these near-death experiences from my ends, I noticed that quite a, f you know, a number of people said, and when I went back into my body, it actually bounced on the bed. I've never heard a doctor or a nurse acknowledge that there was a bounce when the person woke up. Have any of you or anybody in the audience ever heard of such a thing? Go ahead, Anna. Okay, what, what happened to me is that the moment I came back, I, I don't know if it was the bouncing or the electroshocks, but I remember very well doctors shouting, she's back. And then once again, they, I remember those words two or three times when I was just not quite convinced to stay until I did. But, but this bouncing, I, I think it, it was so hurtful. Maybe I confused it or I, I, I felt it like if it was the electroshocks. But it was so painful, so, so painful. It's like fitting into a body you don't even want to go in. And then you have to stay there and it feels like you're content. I think if you read one of P.H. and Matt Waters' books, she says, I went back into her body. And it's a beautiful statement. She, she's saying, and she's sitting over there, she says, I went back into her body. And that's how you feel about it. I'm going back into his body, not mine, his. Okay. And he's a dead meat. And he's a dead meat, you know. <laughs> and, and that's how Anna's trying to say that. It's uh, so awful to go back in. And, Probably, I will forgive the medical professionals, when you're sleeping and you, you suddenly wake up just before you're falling asleep, oh, they good. probably think that's yeah. all we're doing. We're just doing that. They don't realize what's happening. And maybe that's why we jump when we wake up, yeah. because we're coming back into our body. Thanks. Thank you for all of your stories. I enjoyed all of them. I'm just curious if you can recall prior to your experiences, were you avid, vivid dreamers? And did that change after your experiences? Did you have more prophetic dreams, vivid dreams, sensation type dreams? Well, in my case, I, 
I feel that this uh, being wonderful ghost or however, this friend of mine, Raffle, it was somebody that I would constantly talk to. And I felt I was very united to the other side. It was not strange to me to feel constant uh, emotions or things that could happen, even dream about them before they happened. After I came back, it has happened to me several times and very clearly that in my dreams, I've, I've been given uh, people that are not here anymore. I receive messages that I, at the beginning I was very unsure to even come uh, share them with the people that they asked me to share them with. And then every single one of the ones I've, I've received and then shared, they're true. Information I ne that didn't even know. For example, a friend of mine, he told me, tell Mimi's, that's the way he called her, his wife, I didn't even know that, that I'm okay. I'm finally doing what exactly what I always wanted. And I saw him like if he was uh, doing in an opera and an orchestra, he was with a lot of music and acting. And I felt, I saw him there. And then I went to her, I didn't even know he was an engineer, nothing to do with that. So when I went to her and told her, well, I, I, I dreamt with your husband and I don't know if I should share this. She said, please, because I need answers. Well, he told me this and this, and then she started crying. Nobody knew he called me Mimis. And well, like this, it's been many, many times for me. My, my connection, it's much stronger. I, I feel people, I feel things. It's difficult because sometimes you don't know if it's your imagination, if it's real. And many times when it's a dream, it's absolutely real. So that has changed a lot with me. Do you feel like you've revisited an area again? Many times. Dreams? Many times, yes. When I'm, I'm meditating, right now, I could, if I would have stopped, I could have closed my eyes and gone back and really, because all of my body starts, feel, it's like if it starts to disintegrate. It's, it's a very strange sensation. I, I know I've, I've had, in my dreams, I've gone visit places. I knew, I just knew about a, Lady, one night I dreamed, but I knew I was there, and we were walking on the beach, and she was telling me that I should come and work with her because she was had a wonderful thing to do, and she was showing me around. And we were walking in the beach, and I said, not now, I have a lot of things to do now. But I know it'll be okay, but I'll see you later. And that was it, and I woke up, and it was so strong that I wrote to her, hello, how are you? And then she never answered. By midnight, I, by midday, I knew that she had died that night. Mm -hmm. So I was, I mean, and she was in the beach with the family. Mm -hmm. So those things have happened. So I think if you listen carefully to what Anna was saying, she's doing a lot of mediumship in her dreams with people. That's what's going on. And it happens different ways for each of us. I do my mediumship more with, okay, I'm gonna be a medium now and, and just go into the power. But she just goes in dreams and there it is. But I wanted to share that, um, Whenever I have an accident now, and I have two accidents that um, were, you might say, life-threatening or otherwise, I check out before the thing starts. I just go, and then 30 seconds later, I'm back, and I'm not injured. I'm just, you know, I became a jellyfish while I was, you know, while I was there, and I, it's happened twice. I just check out for 30 seconds. I don't get to the white light. I just go to all white and then come back in. And so once you've slipped out, uh, believe me, you'll slip out again. And um, you know the, the airbags come on and everything happens and the car rolls and but I'm not there. Do you feel like you have control over that or just? I don't. Um, all I can say is once you've slipped out, it's easy to do again. I couldn't say one, two, three. Now I'm out. But as a medium, I go into the power and I, you know, I, I talk to the other side. She does it in her dreams. My wife is, does a lot in her dreams this way. She's this kind of she sees all kinds of things, and so it, it, it happens to each of us differently. My own dreams, I, don't, I never saw any dreams before and I don't see any dreams afterwards. I'm, I'm too much on the practical side when I'm here. Mm -hmm. And when I become a medium, I just open up and let it come through me and I, I totally shift from the analytical mind. What's your experience on this, Bernd? Yeah, I had the experience that I met my parents in my dreams afterwards and I could talk with them. And uh, even one time in the church, I had the feeling they were there even my dead brother, I never knew who died when he was six. And I came some years later, four years later. He was there looking like 30. It was very strange. I never told that 
so you hear that the first time here. <laughs> because they think I'm crazy. I'm a psychoanalyst in Germany, and uh, I cannot... Cannot be a crazy that. psychoanalyst, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to tell that there. And I had the, the second thing was, I'm working with couples. I'm a couple therapist too. And after the incident, I was pretty sure I knew if they would separate or not, which is a, um, a question they always, uh, couples are thinking of. And I had the feeling I knew if somebody would die soon or would live longer. And I verified that in two cases. This is nothing I know. But uh, somebody who they said, he will die soon, and I knew he would not. And I was right. That's good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'd like to throw a second question. First, thank you again for coming here and sharing your experience and your stories. Um, outside of the near death, though, Anna, you referred to a entity, the raffle, or that's your name for whatever. Is it uh, like a bean or something? For me, later on, I it's not. I knew the, that he or she, she or it. That's why I named him like that because I was playing when I was around seven or eight, and I felt someone always there. And I said, well, I don't know if you're a male or if you're a female, so instead of Rafael or Rafaela, Raf Raffle is fine. So I started talking to him, and I, I knew it was there all the time. At first, I thought he, he was coming for me each time. And I said, wait, I'm not ready. I don't want to, because I just remember this is a girl that has been dying since she was born, me. And my, there was a, always an expectation that I was not going to make it because there was no physical possibility that my heart could stand up to that long. So with this friendship, I knew that I was going to go on. And it's like I then understood that it was always taking care of me. When I was freezing sometimes, when I was in real danger, that I was in the hospital and almost dying, I, death and I have been close to each other many, many times during my lifetime. But this friend, I, I later on could understand that it was real. First, I thought, well, it was just a, an imaginary friend. But then when I was 12, it was again. And then when I was 15, it was there again. And in many, many moments, and the, one of the strongest time was just before I went to surgery, that I really asked him, if you, Raffle, have some influence in this, if I made any, I think in, I come from a Catholic religion, so if I did anything wrong, please tell him to forgive me, tell God to forgive me. And I was going to pay back by raising a wonderful child. Just give me the chance. And then I just felt love from this being. A lot. He embraced me. He just smiled. And I said, stop playing around with me. I mean it. And I could just speak like that. I was just never in words. Of course, it was all inside me. And every time I needed answers, I knew it was inside me, the, all the answers. So at that moment is when I strongly felt that he had been there, it had been there with me, and it was just love all, all the way around. And now I, I, I know I survived. Nobody understands how after this stuff, because nobody thought I was gonna be out of this, but just like Anita mentioned, something happened that doctors now say, oh, well, we just don't get it, but she's there. Yeah, so that's raffle for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Um, after my nearly death experience, I had problems with my emotions. I was searching for my emotions with my body. What are my emotions? How do I get start feeling again? Can you share with us how you three did it? Happy, angry? Crying. Okay, well, when, when I came back, the first thing was everything made me cry. I was sympathetic with everything. Yes. I couldn't, um, it, sometimes you see me tear up when I'm on the stage. Um, and it was the, that like that all the time. If a, if a fly died, I was feeling bad about it. I mean, that's how I came back. So I was a, a total, uh, people would say he's an emotional wreck, but it wasn't that. It was total empathy with everything. 
And so I had to learn to kind of separate myself from that and, and, and hold back from it and yes. not be touching everybody and all the time. And so if, if you see me hug almost everybody all the time, it's because I'm, I've opened that back up. I really feel for everything all over the place. And I, you had to learn to, to just close it off and not be out there because it's, it's really out there. At least that was my experience. Okay. I couldn't um, not feel. Um, yes. And I still have that problem. I, I don't understand when somebody cuts somebody else off in traffic, I, I have to not look at it because I can't understand why did they do that? Don't they know the other person's there? You know, or they cut in line and all the stuff they do all the time. Mm -hmm. I just, I just have to. Oh, why, why are they doing that? You know, and I, it, it hurts me. So you have to learn to be insulated against that. So I insulate against it and 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 don't notice. That's what I had to learn to do. It was, it was difficult. It took a couple, three years to get to where I could just totally not get involved. Okay. Just not, not, not get over there and that stuff. And you're saying you're, you want to turn them back on again. They're, they're a little n numb. You're just being numb for, to protect yourself. They're there. So you're saying, how do you handle anger? I can still get angry, especially if it's, you know, some, some, um, something going wrong in the system. You know, I can really get angry. I can do that. Um, at first it, it wasn't anything to get angry about. But after you, after you live in this uh, for another 20 years, you begin to get back into, you know, I can get mad. <laughs> you start to do that again sometimes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. So you're, you're going to be okay. For me, it was, um, when I came back, it was love all around. I was so happy that I was going to be able to see my daughter once again. Uh, it had already been almost two months without, she was a baby when I left her, when I was in the hospital. I, I, as I said, I wanted to touch everybody. I wanted to hug everybody and thank, be thankful for, to what everybody. What kind of feeling was it? Was it joy or was it the embracing the unconditional love? What was it that you want to spread out? In, unconditional to, love. It doesn't yes. matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter who you are. You're someone I can love and I can, and, and I can give to. What happened later on is that mm -hmm. it was so difficult for me to communicate all of this with family, with my husband. We, we stopped understanding we were not talking the same, the same language. And I felt like he said, you have to stop not, for example, what he said, oh, you don't have to touch everybody. Stop telling them that they're so nice and stop <laughs> thanking everybody and stop, yes. stop. And I was yes. just because they're going to think that you're just fl flirting. And I, was, I, and I just became conscious of... But, but I'm not doing that. That's not my intention. And he said, well, then it, it started to be very difficult for me. And then I knew that I could get angry very easily later on because of the system. How, how can they think that this is a mother hugging a baby and just give him the seat? Why don't you understand that she's suffering? And judgment is something that I just couldn't handle anymore. How can you judge if you don't even know their story? One of the greatest things I taught my children because then I adopted a son. I was not supposed to have any more children. And the, one of the greatest things I taught them is about love and no judgment. You don't know what's behind any scenery. So this was something very difficult for me when someone came and said stories of someone that you don't even know what's behind that. I struggled with that. So yes, emotions, it's very difficult, but mostly for me it was the kind of way that I could give love to people. Okay. I had to restrain it, but at the end it was joy. I knew there was so much to share, and that's my job now. I know I have to reconnect, that's why Ina Ians was so wonderful for me, because you know there's family around that are, that are going to understand you, and who you can share, and then there's people that are gonna start listening. Oh. She's saying something to a lot of people, and they're listening. Let's hear back again. What are you talking about? You see, but it, it was difficult, yes. Yes, sir. For how long? Five years? Or? Well, uh, at the beginning, it was I, I got divorced after oh. some years. We, we all it's ended up divorced. It's happening a lot, eh? yes. 
because I, I, I stood there for 10 more years and I said that is maybe also because of that emotional yes another yeah. connection with emotions eh? it's really I, amazing I couldn't understand why is it that I was not going to be even if I under my culture I was a woman and I had a lot to share mm -hmm. and he told me no but I'm the one that should talk well yes but you don't know what I'm feeling right now <laughs> okay you tell me yes. and I'll say it and okay. it was like that so we, well, Thank we have you. to stop this. Yes. Uh, in relationships, the, the spouse doesn't understand why you love everybody and not just them. Yes. They just don't, they just have trouble with that because they haven't had a near death experience. And you, you love everybody. You, we you all know, have to search for other forms to yeah. share that so, kind of unconditional love and to make it in a form of your expression and the emotions. Eh? That's and, so and, and that people are able to receive new it. Part. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And most, okay, most of married. us do get divorced. <laughs> Go ahead. He's okay, still married. I'm, st I'm still married. My wife's sitting here. She <laughs> saved my bodily life by um, doing a heart uh, massage. Uh, How do you call that in uh, CPR? CPR. The CPR. But that was not the reason. We were just married half a year, although she got breast cancer at that time, and. Um, she did understand what I experienced, which deepened our relationship emotionally. And also a little bit my therapies changed. They got more, more um, focused on emotion than yes. before. But I was mm -hmm. trained with emotion anyway. It didn't change so much, I think, as it did in you. Oh. And may maybe, I don't know what the reason was, no. I, I, I didn't change my life, more or less. I had a good job, I have a wonderful life, I have a wonderful relationship, so it just deepened it. Sabina, you were asking, how long does it take? It's been 46 years, I still struggle with it. It took me two, 10 years yeah. to feel normal emotions again. It yeah. was so high sensitive. And um, I thank you, great. Thank Maybe you. you're protecting yourself. Sorry? Maybe you're protecting yourself from the deep emotions. Yeah, yeah I you think so. Maybe insulating yourself. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's a it normal hurts. way because the emotions are with your body, and when you are in the light or you have your nearly death experience, you have no body. So it's amazing what's happening, like a landscape. Your body, like a landscape. That's a positive one. Eh? Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. I just have a little message for you, Anna. I don't know if you've studied anything about archangels. Um, I knew that just before I published my book, but tell me. I, I just wanted to remind you that Archangel Raphael is the archangel of, of healing and health. And I wondered if you've ever um, had the green color associated with your friend, Rafi, because it's the green color that's associated with Archangel Raphael. Yes, I've always liked green bluish and that's the color i prefer of all yes you're right thank you that was good you got archangel yes. Raphael. <laughs> oh, good day thank you for being here i have a question uh, for all of you. Uh, you you've described described how it's like to get back into the body i'm wondering what it was like if you have a visual of when you left the body i had a, an experience with my mother in the hospital, she was unconscious, her last breath, and uh, I told her she could stay or go, uh, no judgment, what I learned from Bernie Siegel. And then she, with her thumb, she squeezed my hand, and then I saw like a double ribbon floating from her thymus and her head going up, and very uh, gentle floating, you know, like a balloon going up. D did you have any visual? when you left her and his body? body. <laughs> uh, you know, I woke up with a light. I didn't have any visual going out. I don't remember anything of, um, after they, I was in the hospital, and after they said, we took care of everything, called your parents, uh, it's all together. They say, I just went out of there. As soon as, as soon as I could relax, I was going into a coma. So I don't remember anything until I woke up with a light. I died in the arms of my wife and there was nothing I could tell. I, I did see my, myself coming out 
and perfectly well just like turned around and looked at my body. Well, you don't need to turn around. Once you go, you start looking at everything everywhere. It's, uh, well, it's just turning around because of the human mind thinking like that. But it's really the moment I went up, I could immediately feel that I was out of there and see my body perfectly well with a lot of dogs. That's, that's when I knew that there were about 15 doctors around me. I could have never known that. I was, I was in a coma. I was unconscious. But I saw that, and then they uh, proved, I mean, I was told that I was right. There was a lot of doctors around me. A lot of people came in. And I was looking at that until I just decided to go someplace else. But I did see when my, I came out of my body. So we had um, someone say, and I'm, I'm not remembering who, the other day was they, they came out of their body and they kind of went next to the bed and they stood up in their full body by the bed. Um, so there are some things, if you research it, you'll find people who will describe a little bit about the, the essence or the smoke or whatever coming out of the body and then forming a new body. Um, there are things there, but we just don't have that memory. Um, thank you for sharing. And I have heard some incredible stories of, of many NDEs, and I've gone through that myself. Um, and the love that we all feel is very, very real, and it's eternal. But I have not heard any discussion of the fact that evilness has existed for many generations, not just here, but elsewhere. What, how do you deal with it as you continue to live your life on this planet? That is my question. Okay, I, um, the way I've dealt with evil for a long time now, and it, uh, the, the experience was, was uh, almost 50 years ago. So I've been dealing with evil in this fashion. As a physicist, what we observe is what we get. That's what I was talking about this morning. The observer principle, what you observe is what you get. I don't observe evil. I don't allow it any energy. I know we have ISIS. I know we have these things out there that the news is reporting. Um, it, evil is... This is real hard to understand, okay? But I'll try and, and put it in a, in a statement that you'll make sense for you. When Hitler was killing the Jews, he thought he was doing a good thing. Good and evil are a choice we make. And this is a beautiful poem that I like. And it's from Rumi. Out beyond doing good and doing bad is a field and I will meet you there. And the story of Adam and Eve and learning to choose good and evil, the knowing that like the gods do good and evil, it's what we do in this world. But out beyond good and evil, there's a field, and that's where the I am is. That's where the consciousness is. And so we see all this evil. Um, again, I don't give evil energy. I don't allow for evil spirits. I don't allow any energy there as much as possible. I, I try to give it no energy because we create our reality. And that's what I was talking about with the quantum physics. We create our reality. And you can heal the earth by not allowing the evil to be. Uh, I was just, just what you said now for me, it is so easy. Like someone asked me, how can you love someone? that is hurting you, someone that is killing children, someone that, well, you have two options, either do that back to them or love them. And I have no uh, evil to give them, but I have love to give them. And once you do that, it, something happens around you that this energy is not in there anymore. I mean, you don't even allow it close to you. And I believe that uh, we decide Either we let evil in or not. But once you're looking at it, like, for example, in Mexico, there's a lot of these things, killings and abuses and all this. And the only thing that comes to my mind is, okay, you can do that to children, but I can give you back love. 
that I don't have that, I don't have hate for you, I don't have judgment for you. And in the energy, all that energy that's gonna get to them keeps me clean. I remember a woman, uh, a teacher telling me, just remember always keep yourself clean. And for me, this means a lot of not allowing this evil, not even doing it or, or, or admitting it close to me. Once I'm listening to a lot of terrible news, I just wanna stop that. Because there's, I know it exists, but letting, in, letting them come in me, it's just gonna hurt me. So I just start bringing them light and love. And because I know there's love at the end. There's, that's the only thing I found when I went there. So I know the only thing that we're going to receive is love. I, Anita mentioned it yesterday that having is not a place. It's a, uh, it's a state of mind. And that's in the state of mind I want to be constantly living and sharing. So I think it has a lot to do with us to decide. Either we accept it or we just reject it with love. Back. When I met people in that state of mind, I always found very, very deeply hurt persons. Deeply hurt. That's right. And if, I don't know if Suzanne's here, but she would tell you, just turn off the TV. And I agree with what you're saying. I, I think I don't know, one of my states of heightened awareness, I saw that, that we're all wounded. You know, that here, here we are, the walking wounded, and, and we are making choices to heal and through our different life paths. And those that are hurting and acting out, they're really hurting others through their own pain. And what they need most from us is, is our love and our compassion and our prayers. And even in Hitler, even in Hitler, there was that spark of light that maybe was dim. We didn't see so much that because he thought he was doing good in his illusion. But even there, even in the darkest of dark, there is a spark. And we know if we go into a dark room, one little tiny spark can light up the room. And, and that's what we're all doing here is we're sharing our light and our spark with others. Was Hitler an angel playing a role? Perhaps. Mm. Mm. Perhaps. That's a thought most people can't think. But he could have been playing a role. My family is actually from Iraq. My dad was born in Baghdad, and, and uh, it's been hard to be on both sides, but I pray for both sides, you know? I had, actually had family fighting on both sides of the war. That was, that was easier for us to see in the First World War, where you know, people had German relatives and they had English relatives and they're sitting there and, and they stop at Christmas time and sing Christmas carols together and then they go back to fighting. And that's what you're talking about, both sides of a war. Who's wrong? Who's right? Yes, I think that what uh, Bert was just saying is that when you, when you stop judging and try to empathize with anybody that's doing what to your eyes is a lot of harm, you see that these people, they're lacking so much love. And if there's not someone to love them or to at least the hope for them good, the things are going to get worse. So if you go back and give them back what they're doing, it's not going to help at all. So I just, I think that the clue to this is just trying to understand what's behind these actions and try to, to avoid them or to, to get rid of them through love. The love, all the, for me, all the love is about energy. Just send it out. Send it to Iran. Send it to Iraq. Send it to wherever is needed. All of this love I have inside of this energy, you send it out over there. Someone's going to get it. Because those people hurting others, they're under a lot of pain, and they need love. You know, and, and Gandhi said, an, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. That's right. So if we share our love, then maybe the whole world will see. But it's even worse, there's a little Hitler in all of us. Yeah, that's a, and that's so, the part that needs healing, right? Yeah, the next time they cut you off in traffic and you give them the finger, you know. That's, yeah. Remember that what he just said, there's a little Hitler in all of us. I bless them, I bless them. I have to remind myself, that's a perfect opportunity. Anyway, two thoughts. Um, number one, uh, to Anna, when um, 
where Becca was mentioning about the Archangel Raphael, the Archangel of Healing, um, you were talking about Raf, Rafi or Raf as Raffle. you're not sure if he was male or female, so you chose a, you know... A mid-name. A mid-name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, they say that the archangels can present in either male or female form, that all of us are androgynous, really. We have both, we have both yes. parts, aspects awesome. within ourselves. So perhaps some really intuitive part of yourself knew it wasn't one or the other. I think so, because I remember very well I was in the garden playing with my little dog, and that's the moment where it hit me. Well, okay, who are you? And I was talking out loud that moment. Okay, Rafael, Rafaela, and because I, have, I had a friend that was named Rafaela, and then Rafael, no, because I think you're not a man, but I don't know if you're a woman, so that moment came to me that I should put just Rafael, Rafael. And then when I went to Spain with my sister, that she lives over there, uh, I knew that Rafael is um, it's the name for Rafael in uh, Catalan. I don't know. Uh, Catalan, is that the... Okay, so, and then I started, when I knew that, I started to look into the dictionary and started, and there's where I knew that I put it in my book, just at the end, it was about to be printed, and then I just knew about that he was a healer. So all the time, I didn't even know anything about meditating. I knew nothing about life. But when I decided to write the book, I said, I need to mention that children have a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of information that we just keep apart and we don't even listen to them when maybe we, they're, they're the one telling us all the answers. And maybe I knew in my heart it was not a male or a female. It was just an angel. And I didn't, at first I thought it was a ghost, and then it was that it was an angel. Are you good? Are you bad? But then I came to know that he was always there when I was in trouble. So then I decided he was a friend. Okay. And then I just share the different stories, like you're going to laugh a lot with them, and then uh, cry with them too. But I know it was, at the end, it was this wonderful being. And then I just wanted to mention, they were, someone was asking the question about jumping in the body, a, a medical person, hospice nurse, or whatever. So I, I am a hospice nurse, and I want to respond to that person. Um, I very much feel that in the, the, last days of, the last days and hours of life that, that the person has a foot in both worlds. Sometimes they're more here and sometimes they're more there and they come back and they be maybe telling us of what they saw on the other side There are those who dismiss it and say it's the medication, but it doesn't matter whether they have medication or not They actually can see what we cannot well, many of us cannot physically see in the room so some often they may be sleeping and you do see a certain jumping as often as they and I really do think that they're, they're kind of waking up and they're a little confused about what world they're in. So I see that. A second thing that I have seen uh, in observation is that commonly there is apnea, a temporary cessation of breath. And sometimes more morphine-induced, but it will happen regardless of the morphine or not. Um, in some people, and if you try to talk to a person in apnea, it's as if they do not hear you. Uh, and if you just wait until they start to take that breath, which I almost feel is like breathing in the spirit in, on some level, and they're able to communicate, they will speak to you. And I've tried it time and time and time again, and it has not, it has not failed me, as long as they're able to communicate. So I think that there is something about that that we can see with our very own eyes if we, if we uh, pay attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for Thank that. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.